Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Socially Radical Guitarist. Um, so the song you heard just now was from uh, La Compañía does F-A-R-E-P, F-A-R-C-E-P, F -A -R -C -E -P, um, called uh, La Guanenga. So just a reminder to everybody that um, these people, they take up arms for a reason. And in this case, the reason is partly the Canadian government. Um, and uh, now the guest is going to be um, touching upon that. Uh, his name is Daniel Z. He's the associate editor of the Canada Files. He's also a comrade, a member of the party, a member of the Communist Party of Canada. Um, hello, Daniel. Hello, Christian. Pleasure to be on here today. Ah, thank you. Uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you for accepting the invite. Um, so I'm um, just wanting to, you know, get right into the, the article um, that you put up on, on Canada Files talking about um, Colombia. You basically made two major points. Um, the first major point is that um, Canada has complicity in the atrocities that the Colombian government is committing. And uh, the second is that this government is a far right, anti black, anti LGBT, anti worker, anti peasant government. Um, so, can you elaborate on those two um, basically summaries that you had made in the article? And I'm cool. So, for the article on Columbia, I saw what I discovered in my research as well as my discussions with both Pablo Bianco, the former director of Teleson, and the current member of the Canadian Latin American Alliance, as well as a, a, a Colombian that on the ground. So what I just figured out, found out is that the current chain of protests, the, the recent uh, protests in Colombia is caused by an effort to push forth a tax reform that would have provided massive breaks for corporations while overtaxing the impoverished working class. It gave way to mass protests in which the Colombian state responded with some horrific violence. There was details of horrific police brutality, murders by the police, actual sexual violence being carried out. And what I learned is that Basically, <clears throat> this all ties back to the fact that the current government, which is led by Ivan Duque, who's a member of the far right party of Alvaro Uribe, the president of Colombia in the 2000s. And uh, <clears throat> and basically what they represented, they represent the interests of the elite landholders in Colombia, which have owned 81% of the land. With this disparity, Vivianco noting, going back to the colonial period under Spanish rule. The current wave of violence was unleashed in the 1940s with the assassination of Jorge Gaitan, the Colombian president that basically promised land reform, but got assassinated. And this led to the period called La Valencia, a period of political violence that culminated in the rise of the of FARC, which seeks to overthrow the land holding class and create a government that is more equ equitable for the, that can go through the more equitable land, land reform. <laughs> And I've noticed that during this crisis, the Canadian governments, they've been backing the Colombian government against, against the FARC. The Canadian government in the 1990s, they've basically sent over attack helicopters to Colombia by, despite the fact that arms treaties prevented them from doing so by basically sending the helicopters over to the United States to be sold. And in, and even more in the 2013, the Harper government 
added Columbia to the automated firearms country control list, which allowed them to purchase automatic firearms such as assault rifles. This basically <laughs> created a protest from the human rights organizations such as Amnesty International, which was concerned they might find their way into the hands of paramilitaries or human rights abusers. 80% of the human rights abuse being tied to far-right paramilitaries, but the Canadian government obviously gave no concern about this. In the recent protests, the Colombian security forces were using APCs manufactured in Barrie, Ontario by Incas that, and in 20, a 2015 report, we, it's found that Colombia also paid 84 million from 32, for 32 bulletproof armor vehicles from the Canadian affiliate of General Dynamics Land Systems to be used to on the border with Venezuela for the purpose of basically saber rattling because the government accused the Venezuelan government of fermenting FARC that terrorism in, in Colombia and to also be used against quote unquote illegal armed groups. So Canada played a major role in basically perpetuating police brutality in Colombia and basically helping the Colombian army and security force against FARC. And what's worse is that many of these against FARC and what's noteworthy, not what's the worst, what's noteworthy is that many of these security forces, they were actually trained by the RCMP and the Canadian Border Security Agency. They, the Canada has provided 5.4 million through the anti-crime capacity building program to facilitate this training. So we have an example of police brutality in Canada making its way to influence police and military brutality in Colombia. And this is exactly how Canada is complicit in the atrocities in Colombia. They basically are helping this regime that's trying to preserve the status quo of land inequality and social hierarchy, this horrific status quo, they're helping to basically per perpetuate and uphold. And so you mentioned that you wanted to, one of the other takeaways is that the Colombian government is a far right regime we shouldn't be associated with. And that's exactly the case. The party that Ivan Duque and uh, Alvaro Uribe belongs to, which is the which is the Democratic Center Party. They are tied to the landholding class, as I said, as Pablo Vivianco told me. And during the 2012 to 2016 negotiation for the peace treaty in Colombia, that was undertaken by Juan Manuel Santos, the liberal president, Uribe and the Democratic Center, they basically spread trumped up rumors that the, the Democrat, the peace treaty would impose quote unquote gender ideology supported by Venezuela in Colombia. It's basically the sort of thing you'd expect Rebel News or Maxine Bernier or the Conservative Party to say. And what they were specifically targeting was the fact that the original draft of the peace process provided significant protections from, for Afro-Colombians, Indigenous Colombians, women, and LGBTQIA minorities and identities in Colombia. And they basically raised fear mongering over this and they basically caused a referendum in which 50.2 of the population narrowly rejected the 
promised draft, <clears throat> the promised draft of the constitution and the revision watered down and made murky some of these protections. So basically it's much harder to protect uh, indigenous Colombians or LGBTIQ people because they've been all lumped into the marginalized populations provision within that peace treaty. And they basically emphasize women more than any other sexual identity. So it basically put a lot of marginalized groups at risk to further political violence, which has resulted in many massacres and the deaths of 1,000 social movement leaders in Colombia. And basically what, and basically, so basically when it resulted in the deaths of 1,000 social movement leaders in Col Colombia. And what should be noted is that during the protest, the one of the demands of the protesters was for the leadership of the Dem DC Democratic Center to such as Uribe and Santos to face trial for crimes against humanity. And <laughs> These crimes against humanity were spurred not only by the scrapping of any sort of gen protections of marginalized identities, but also the fact that uh, the peace treaty made it so that any sort of land in the conflict zones can't be divided to the peasants and that the FARC will have to have 30% of its federal funding cut if they organize politically to prevent them from taking power. So I think that DC is somewhat aware how popular the FARC's ideas are and are trying to work to get them to not come to power electorally. So looking at the polls in Colombia and what's at stake in the next election, it seems that FARC, <laughs> could potentially get to power by electoral means and be the part of a new pink tie that had swept once again through Bolivia with the defeat of the Aeneid coup and in Peru with the victory of Pedro Castillo. Excellent. So, and what I want to discuss overall with the article is that Canada is, is not is actually a major force of imperialism in the world. We are not just like say march, we not only march with the US in lockstep with stuff like say the new Cold War and saber rattling against China, but we've also been our mining companies as a graph being passed around on Twitter have investments in 74.5 percent of have our mining companies have investments in 74.5 percent of the world with the graph showing our investments in Africa so there's this idea that we are and Colombia is actually one of the places our mining oil companies have interest in and they've been helped by the Canadian government not only through their deals with the far right democratic center and its politicians, but also through its, <clears throat> but also through the fact that Colum Canada has helped liberalize Con Colombia's laws, first by creating a constitutional amendment that allows 40% of Colombia land to essentially be free property for mining, mining companies, which basically creates even more dispossession. And our mining and oil companies themselves employ paramilitaries to basically drive people, specifically indigenous and Afro-Colombians out of land in order to basically hoard the land for their mining and oil projects. It's clear that Canada's foreign policy shows that not only is not a, it's anti-black and anti-indigenous on a global scale, not just on a domestic scale, but it's not a country that's pinned itself as this friendly 
polite face and somehow less quote unquote meaner than the US is pretty fucking terrible in its own way. And I hope that people around the world pay attention to that. So with given how Justin Trudeau's efforts last year to get into the security council failed big time, it may well be that they are paying attention to, to this issue. And I, but I hope that Canadians also pay attention to this issue too and demand in elections such as this one that we change our country's foreign policy from imperialist one to an independent and diplo diplomacy oriented one that does not step into the dictations of the US and our mining and oil companies that seek to export so much of the world and cause ecological damage and dispossession of indigenous and other marginalized identities. Yeah, um, that's, that's a great message um, mm -hmm. to go with a great article. Um, mm -hmm. I, actually, um, yeah, that was a great, you know, sum, summation of um, the, all of the topics in that article and what was going on. Um, going to domestic politics, um, I noticed that um, you, you, you were on track to write something for the uh, Toronto Climate Justice, uh, uh, yeah, Climate Justice Ontario. Uh, uh, C oh no, CTJO. CJTO. Yeah, climate, yeah, yeah, yeah. CGTO, Climate Justice Toronto. And um, you wanted to um, maybe be a little bit more diplomatic than the, the message that you really want to make on, on the Canada files where you're explicit and you talk about um, what Canada. So for the CJTO article, I want, I want to examine some of the policies of the NDP going to the election. And uh, I, my argument is that the Canadian left should not depend on the NDP as the source of progressive change. The NDP has had a really problematic foreign policy that at best only like softens Canadian imperialism, but at worst actually, actually helps participate Precipitating it, while the domestic and climate justice policies do little to ensure COVID, COVID zero or mass access to like the vaccines or mass access to ways to keep the COVID numbers down. And they've also like, and with regards to environment and indigenous justice, they've, if you look at Ferry Creek, if you look at what John Horgan is doing, the NDP have both betrayed climate justice principles and the just principles of indigenous self-determination in favor of the pipelines. And I'm trying to argue that the left should be more critical. We should focus on building in building alliances independent and coalitions independent of the electoral politics. Yeah, um, you did say you wanted to write a book about that. Um, can you talk a little bit about that book? And I'm thinking of expanding this into a book in later on. Mm -hmm. If I if the article is successful enough, detailing a more critical look at the NDP from a left wing lens. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Um, yeah. So I mean, that was basically. It, for today, all, all that we were going to talk about, thank you for coming on, uh, Daniel. You're welcome. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And now uh, we're going to be heading out and um, I'm going to be playing something. Um, it's the fed, we had the oil suits from the company Quail. Oh, uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, Daniel actually asked me to play. The first one to do that. So um, we're going to be heading into me playing. I've got to get my guitar. And then after that, we'll have the outro and that'll be the end of the show. So stay tuned.